All right, folks, welcome to lesson 12, Alternative Mechanisms of Carbon Fixing. And we're gonna look at the aspects that involve carbon fixation of different types and different methods under different circumstances of plants, because much like aerobic respiration, different plants fix carbon differently in, in terms of the environment that they are presented with, right? So when you look at aerobic versus anaerobic respiration, the supply of oxygen versus the, the lack of oxygen and what processes different cells go through, we're gonna look at essentially the equivalent, the plant equivalent of that type of mechanism. So we'll look at the pathways that are responsible for kind of determining when and how different carbons should be fixed. So recall that plants need to go through photosynthesis, utilizing that CO2, utilizing that water, utilizing that light, all in an attempt to make that glucose. And the reason that it needs all of those things that we looked at in terms of last lesson is to go through that photosynthetic process, which happens in the leaves of that plant, right? When we think about what's the green component of a plant, it's always going to be, for the most part, in some cases, it's the stalk or some flowers exert those colors. But for the most part, we're looking at the leaves of the plant. So water is a major, major, major part of the cytosol and it's also contained in the vacuole of the cell right that vacuole being very specialized in plants being larger and they hold that water in those vacuoles aquatic plants have the luxury of a constant water supply depending on where that specific aquatic plant lives it could be in salt water it could be in fresh water but regardless they have a constant supply of water so they don't have to really worry about storing it as much so a problem can arise, however, what happens when plants try to exchange gases with their environments without having a respiratory system? They don't have a specific, a specific system that you studied in grade 11 for, plant, or for animals to bring in that gas into their cells, to bring that gas into their systems as a whole. So how do they do this without losing tons of water? <coughs> Excuse me. So let's take a quick look at the cross section of the leaves anatomy. So when we think about the leaf anatomy and we look at some of the components of it that you hopefully remember from grade 10, there's an airspace sac that is essentially going to allow for that diffusion of gas in. And there's also what's called those stoma or those guard cell, which kind of allow for those gases to come in and out. And then when we look at that palisade mesophyll, as well as some of that dermis, you can start to see where that photosynthetic reaction starts to take place. So land plants have several mechanisms with which they prevent water loss. The first is that waxy cuticle. We talked a little bit about it, but wax is that hydrophobic, the hydrophobic chemical or a hydrophobic molecule, if you will, that repels water. And it is meant to keep water in the leaf. So I'm gonna fix that note up because it is quite messy when I was writing that. So it keeps water in the leaf. It's gonna keep water in the leaf. So it prevents that water loss as a result of being hydrophobic. So it keeps water in the leaf. And it allows that water to not be lost when those guard cells open up to allow for gas to come in. And the other component that I kind of alluded to when just speaking about it now, but those stomata, they control that gas exchange. They allow gas exchange when they, they open and they prevent H2O loss when closed. So those two things on land plants work in conjuncture to prevent the loss of water in a, in a photosynthetic system that the leaf provides. So plants living in different environments will have different adaptations to kind of prevent water loss. You think about how much wax, the thickness of the wax specifically, the amount of stoma within the leaf, et cetera. Those are all ways with which different plants in different environments can reduce the amount of water that happens in their cell. So I talked a little bit about Rubisco and its importance uh, with regards to photorespiration. But if you recall that Rubisco fixes carbon, that CO2, the first step of the Calvin cycle to that RUBP, molecule that 156 uh that 156 molecule or 15 sorry not 156 that 15 biphosphate rubisc right 
It's going to catalyze that reaction. It's going to fix that CO2 molecule onto it to allow for it to go through the rest of those stages of that Calvin cycle to make that G3P and then ultimately to make that glucose. Now, as with any enzyme that we have studied in this class to date, Rubisco has a very specific and ideal condition with which it will allow it to catalyze those reactions optimally. It works very slowly and only fixes three CO2 molecules per second. And that's very important to think about it in the context of how plants grow. This is why each plant has so many copies of the enzyme. Because it is so slow, the plant needs to make a lot of that enzyme. It needs a high, 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 high nutrient soil for that growth to occur. And that's why some plants are quite delicate with the type of soil that they can grow in. It's all because of Rubisco. It needs to be able to make that Rubisco in large quantities because of how slow it actually works. So that first problem is the amount of Rubisco and how fast it moves. The second is that Rubisco's active site occasionally binds that oxygen that we talked about, right? It's going to occasionally bind that oxygen because when you think about our atmosphere, it's 21% oxygen compared to only about 0.04% CO2. So that air that ends up in that cell or in the leaf, it's going to be way more O2 than CO2. So as it was alluded to earlier in today when we talked about how Rubisco doesn't quite always optimally work, Rubisco in fact binds to oxygen quite often, right? And so unfortunately it loses that capability to fix that carbon dioxide. So this reaction will produce a RUBP molecule with oxygen. Now, what is the problem with that? Well, it's not useful, right? It's not useful. We need that carbon fixed onto that RUBP to make that six chain carbon to then be converted into glucose through a couple of different steps. So if it's not useful, how do we utilize it? Well, it, it takes many steps to finally produce that RUBP. So when you look on that photorespiration side of our chart, I will just highlight it real quick and then I'll erase the highlight. Right? It has to go through many of those cycles in order to finally, in order to finally fix that CO2 to that RUBP. So it's going to set of reactions are going to require a ton of energy, unfortunately. And this causes the rate of Calvin cycle to decrease significantly. So we're not going to see as much sugar produced as a result of that. So when we looked at that question, uh, question number eight today, when we looked at how different conditions can uh, impact the Calvin cycle's rate of um, creation of sugar, this is another one we can add to that list now that we've kind of learned and understand that Rubisco doesn't work properly all the time. Sometimes it fixes that oxygen. And sometimes that unintended oxygen fixation takes a long time to overcome to fix that carbon dioxide. So we see a decrease in sugars produced by that plant. This unintended reaction is called photorespiration, photorespiration. In many plants, that Rubisco will store enough sugar, let me just fix this, will, will store enough sugar to keep the plant alive for long enough until that carbon dioxide is available. And that's assuming that that carbon dioxide is available, right? The stoma can, the stomata can open up frequently to allow that CO2 in, but essentially that sugar that that plant has stored up in some way, shape or form from proper photosynthesis, it will be enough to keep it alive until carbon dioxide is now finally available. Now, again, you start to see the parallels of aerobic respiration here. There are redundancy systems built into place. If something isn't available for whatever reason, in this case, that G3P, it has some redundancies built in as a result of either storing up glucose or continuing that photorespiration process to finally fix that CO2 to that Rubisco. So the problem that arises as a result of that is that in hot climates, there's going to be CO2, excess CO2 is needed to prevent that photorespiration from dominating over the Calvin cycle. So we need a lot of CO2, and then we need to bring in a lot of CO2 as a result of that. But this also causes problems with regards to water loss. As that stomata need to open up and bring in that CO2, it's also gonna cause water to evaporate. And this is bad. We don't want that to happen. So as that temperature increases, the solubility of CO2 decreases more than the solubility of O2. In hotter climates, there is less CO2 available due to the solubility difference. Oxygen gas dissolves in warmer 
warmer air better than CO2 does. So again, when you think about the polarity of things, when you think about how molecules dissolve, O2 is going to dissolve easier. So now you can start to see a mounting issue that can happen in temperatures uh, or in plants that live in temperatures that are significantly warmer. It's going to really, really, really struggle to fix that CO2 to that Rubisco and that RUBP as a result of those higher temperatures. So what happens? What, like in all things that we've studied in biology in grade 11 and in this course, uh, over many, 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 many generations, things evolve to adapt to the climate, to the system, to the environment that they are living in. The environment changes them and they now have the ability, and in many cases with regards to some plants, they have the ability to kind of minimize that photorespiration. And this happens with the C4 cycle. So we are gonna introduce a new enzyme called PEP carboxylase, and this intercepts CO2 when it enters the leaf and makes it into a four carbon intermediate compound, malate. This compound is now converted back into CO2 when it is needed in the Calvin cycle. This prevents interference with O2 or by O2 with rubisco. So this step that we're gonna look at it, when that stomata opens up, all the gas rushes in and that PEP carboxylase grabs the CO2 real quick and then it allows for that it to create that intermediate of malate, which will then be utilized later in the Calvin cycle, which completely prevents the interference of O2 with rubisco because PEP carboxylase is super good at binding the CO2, doesn't really want to bind with O2. So what are the advantages of that C4 cycle? Well, that PEP carboxylase, like I said, it will not bind to oxygen gas. It doesn't want to have anything to do with oxygen gas. The plant will need way less rubisco as a result, and that means that it will need way less nutrient soil, okay? When we talk about less nutrient soil, we are talking about places with higher climates because higher climate soil tends to be a bit more um, barren in terms of there's less water, so less things will grow, live, and die and provide that nutrients to the soil. So we really start to see less nutrients in those soil, or in soil in climates that are significantly warmer. So again, just to go over that idea again, that CO2 rushes in through the stomata. CO2 is entering the mesophyll cell. That intermediate four carbon chain malate gets formed by PEP carboxylase. And we don't necessarily need that rubisco to kind of go through that process that we've looked at prior to. So they can fix that carbon without the use of rubisco or without the, the quantity of rubisco that we were used to dealing with. So why don't all plants use this mechanism then if it completely makes rubisco not useless but not as useful and it uh, prevents that O2 binding through photorespiration, why not just do this the entire time? Well, it requires an absolute metric ton of ATP to use that C4 cycle. Plants in high light intensity, they're going to make more ATP, right? When we think about that uh, light reaction that happens in the light dependent reactions making ATP, when there's a lot of light, you can make a lot of ATP. So these C4 plants have access to all of that light energy that can be provided via the light dependent reactions in photosystem one and two. So it can invest it in that C4 cycle to make sugar. In places that don't have access to that much light intensity, like in places like Canada, for example, where it's dark and cold for about, oh God, it feels like eight months of the year, it doesn't have access to that highlight intensity to make that much ATP to fix that carbon in the, in the C4 cycle. So it doesn't really make sense for all plants to use that mechanism. So C4 plants are interesting in that they, they have a different method. And so these C4 plants live in areas where, as I alluded to, the climate is very hot during growing season. All right, they're gonna use that C4 cycle to increase the concentration of CO2 that actually gets into the Calvin cycle. And the C4 and Calvin cycle occur in different cells. This is also another issue potentially that arises as a result. Because when you think about, oops, when you think about the mesophyll, the mesophyll cells, that's gonna go through that C4 process. That carbon is fixed in the C4 cells. But the Calvin cycle happens in the bundle sheath cells. So it's gotta to learn to transport that in that fixed carbon and that C4 intermediate malate into that bundle sheath cell so that the Calvin cycle can happen. 
And some examples of plants that, uh, that go through C4 are tropical plants, corn, and again, anything you can think of that grows in an environment that receives plenty of sunlight during their growing season. Uh, so places around the equator, places around, um, yeah, around the equator and southern North America as well as northern South America and anywhere in between that region band, uh, you're going to see a lot of plants that go through C4. Uh, cam plants are the other type, is the other type of alternate method with which that plants fix carbon. Uh, cam or crassulation acid meta metabol blah, 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 blah. Crassulation acid met metabolism plants also use that C4 and Calvin cycle as well. But they also, they also do so in, at different times of the day, essentially. So they do it in the same cell, but at different times. So that way that CAM plants, they don't have to establish that gradient in terms of that building up that malate to then in the mesophyll cells, then pass on to the bundle sheet cell for the Calvin cycle. They don't have to do that, right? Whereas C4 plants definitely do. Instead, they open their stomata at night to allow CO2 to enter while minimizing water loss on account of that temperature as being uh, in hotter places. The temperature is lower it when the sun goes down. So they take in all the CO2 that they can during the night. This minimizes water loss. And then the stomata stay closed during the day to allow the Calvin cycle to occur. Again, as those open stomata will allow too much water loss during the day. So what are some... Uh, these can plants are not found, or, or sorry, are found in hot, dry areas where the temperature decreases significantly overnight. So you think about deserts, uh, specifically in parts of Africa, in parts of um, sub-Saharan Asia, in parts of northern East Asia. It's all going to look at the aspect of can plants existing because the temperature drops significantly, significantly in the nights. But also in like places like Arizona desert as well as the Nevada desert in the United States. Uh, because it really wants to try to increase that CO2 uptake at night and then go through the Calvin cycle during the day. Uh, so as I alluded to, desert plants, cacti, and C3 plants, uh, it has a light reaction Calvin cycle, but no C4. That's just the final point that I have with regards to that. Okay, folks, there's some practice questions with which you to do there, as well as looking at over the entire review content for today's lessons. Uh, so I'm going to leave you to take a look at all that stuff and ask questions if you have them.